so hot over there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Point Counterpoint. Here's your host, Got Mark 76. Everybody, welcome to another edition of Point Counterpoint. I am your host, Scott Mark, 76, a.k.a. Mark Lindsay. We thank you for joining us. And as always, my tag team partner, Bob Stedford. I am back once again. Well, good to see you again, Mark. What's going on with you, man? Not much going on. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, including a controversial topic that you and I disagree on so point counterpoint making its way to the got mark 76 channel djb productions network we're gonna hop right in crack it open it's but, time to talk about wrestling i gotta crack a fresh one but don't crack it over my skull because we don't agree on this one and the question that i posed to you and everybody watching was kurt henning world title material absolutely he was <laughs> All right, why don't, why don't you start this off since you have the more controversial of the two opinions. Okay, then I'm going to say this. I am a huge fan of Kurt Henning. I was a super huge fan of Mr. Perfect. Okay. If you take WWF from 1988 to about 1991 when he was relevant, there was Hulk Hogan, there was Randy Savage, Ultimate Warrior, um... The beginning of Bret Hart. You had all these wrestlers that were larger than life. Absolutely. Under Undertaker came in, uh, debuted. Uh, even Hacksaw Jim Duggan, whether he was a cartoon or not, he was larger than life with the audience. Oh. I loved, I loved Kurt Henning. He, ha he always delivered great matches. I just don't know if he would have been a great World Wrestling Federation champion as Mr. Perfect. Um, if he was... And here's the thing. He got hurt in, what, 91? Went out with a back injury, a major back injury. Took over a year off. Yeah. Collect, collected that insurance money from the Lloyds of London uh, insurance. You know, we, we've heard so much about those Lloyds of London over the year. <laughs> yes, we have. I, I can't imagine they're still in business with all the payouts they've given. No, not between him and Rick Rude and everybody Rick, else. Uh, Road Warrior Hawk, I Road think. Road Warrior, took, yeah. Yep. So <laughs> he, he took over a year off, comes back, has re, has a resurgence of a career, 93 through about 94, 95, but then kind of goes back into the broadcast booth, becomes a manager for Mark Merrow, and then jumps ship, goes to WCW, and gets lost in the shuffle. Oh, if, you had take, if you had taken his prime years... Of 88, 89, 90, and 91 World Wrestling Federation and put him into WCW, I think he would have been a great world champion. But I think I've, his his prime years in the WWF, he was not the larger than life character that they were pushing at that time. I agree. I mean, it was just a time frame thing, really, for me. But uh, I do think he is, without a shadow of a doubt, the best competitor in the ring from bell to bell, be it from character, charisma, uh, in-ring ability. He checked all the boxes, and I think he's the best to never have held that championship. But I do understand where you're coming from as far as saying, like, he just didn't have the larger-than-life persona. But he was also the guy that you could stick in there, and I think people would have paid money to see a guy like Savage, a guy like Hogan, a guy like Brett to go in there and try to take that title off him. Like, I think you could have made a ton of money off of the chase. And the they always say the money's in the chase. I mean, look at a guy like Daniel Bryan. Like, the money was in his chase. What did he do with the belt as a baby face? Yeah, right. If you had, a, if you had a, chill, a, a heel champion like you do Kurt Henning, like you would have Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning, I think there would have been much money in multiple chases. Because you arguably could have started off if he stayed healthy, you could have had him for Brett and Sean, and that could have been the guy they both started off their world title programs with before they got to each other, and they could have had that. And, like, I know triple threats weren't a big thing back then, but think of a dream match between Michaels, Perfect, and Hart in their primes. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah. I, I do think I do think he was world championship material, but not in WCW. Had WCW figured out how to use him rather than just signing him because he worked for New York? I mean, that's a that's a different story. But you know, I, I don't know what it was. I guess did he have to pay his Lloyd's of London back so he could wrestle again? I don't know, but I think that's the that's what I've heard. But I don't know if that's a- accurate or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think I think Mr. Perfect was was ahead of his time, and I, I really believe he he deserved that World Heavyweight Champion. Um, now, see, you bring up a great point. You know, that's something I didn't think of. Um, now, again, this is 1989, 1990. The, the Vince McMahon is is headstrong on Hulk Hogan. Um, sure. He, he made the move to give Ultimate Warrior the world championship, and the Warrior project just did not work out. Ultimate Warrior did not draw at the box office. House shows went down. The ratings went down. Saturday night's main event, which was a prominent show on NBC every quarter, did yeah. not have high ratings with Ultimate Warrior on top of the card. The so, only show ever to delay, to delay Saturday Night Live. Right, right absolutely. A huge That's deal. Cool. But Ultimate Warrior lost the title to Sergeant Slaughter just so Hogan could beat Slaughter. Um, If there was ever a time that Kurt Henning could have been put in that position, it would have been right there. Um, Have him beat Warrior, and then you have the big match with Hogan at WrestleMania. But then, you know, you're you're talking about the Iraqi sympathizer when Sergeant Slaughter was a heel at the time. Uh, It was a timely heel. Yeah. That's all it was. It was nothing but story. Like, there wasn't... You weren't going to have classic matches between no. Slaughter and Warrior, Slaughter Hogan, Slaughter Savage. Like, Slaughter served his part, but nobody's ever going to remember him as one of the best ever. Nope, not at all. Yeah, right. But if you took that opportunity and you put the belt on perfect, I really think you got something there. Because look at that Saturday Night's Made event. I think it was... I could be wrong here. I think it was one of the highest rated Saturday Night Made event. It was... um. It was Hogan against Perfect on Saturday Night's Main Event. It was a tag of some sort, but having Perfect in that main event drew them the big number. I think it was Hogan and Warrior versus Perfect and uh, the Genius. And the Genius, yeah. yeah. For a while. Okay, yep. sorry, my mind goes blank that's sometimes. A, but uh, I'm a mar- I'm a Mark, and I didn't I take as many to, bumps as you, so I know more about wrestling, and I've forgotten even more. <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, like even the house show loop, like in that time, the main event, like people were paying good money to see Perfect get his ass kicked by Hulk Hogan. And like they just, I feel like maybe his size held him back, which sounds silly, but like Perfect was a big dude. Like he was he was bigger than Brett. He was jacked. And, but he wasn't Hogan. He wasn't Warrior. Like those were the two guys they were pushing. Like even when Savage had his time. He was a smaller guy. Mm-hmm. But he, he just had too much charisma. It was undeniable. Now, he was AWA world champion back in the, the days. But at sure. that time, the AWA was way past its glory years. Uh, they had lost yeah. Hogan. They had lost Dr. Schultz. They had locked, uh, lost um, Ken Patera, Bobby Heenan, Gene Erkland. So the AWA was kind of like in the later stages closer to its death than they were in the glory days. Sure. But he had a solid run, uh, defeated Nick Bockwinkle for the title, lost it to Jerry Lawler. So, uh, yes, I could have seen him as a world champion because I saw him in the AWA as a world champion. I just didn't think oh, at that absolutely. time. But let me give Mr. Perfect credit because, again, I don't want it to sound like I'm hating on him. I loved what he did to the Intercontinental title. He made that belt so relevant. Um, oh, he, he made it important. That belt absolutely, yes. And... When somebody like Kerry Von Erich came in, Kerry Von Erich, we, the stories we could tell about Kerry, it's only a uh, half-hour sure. show. Um, just, I think Mr. Perfect was supposed to drop the title to Brutus Beefcake. Then Beefcake had that parasailing accident, and then enter Kerry Von Erich, and you have SummerSlam 90 happening, and Kurt Henning puts over Kerry Von Erich, and then Kerry Von Erich has a great run for sure. about six months as Intercontinental Champion. Nobody and was then, better. Texas Tornado is so exciting in that day. And he's yeah. another guy they squandered and didn't do enough with. And you wonder, where would he be today had he gotten clean and a significant push? If he had gotten clean, where would he be? You know, it's sure. like... But I guess but if you if you have an amputated foot... Like, well, yeah, right. Absolutely. So, 
let's fast forward. So Kurt Henning goes to World Championship Wrestling. He immediately gets put into the U.S. title picture with Diamond Dallas Page. And he becomes a member of the Four Horsemen, which was very short-lived. If they had stuck and stayed with that Four Horsemen storyline, I think Kurt Henning would not have gotten lost in the NWO shuffle. And who knows what would have happened when Bret Hart eventually came in. Uh, you could have had a re-ignition of that feud between Hart and Perfect. Uh, sure. Another missed opportunity. Oh, I agree with that completely. Um, I mean, we did get Bret Hart, Mr. Kurt, or Kurt Henning matches at that point in time. We did get that in WCW, but it certainly wasn't the level of match that we're talking about with, like, SummerSlam 91. Right. Which is still a match I see once to twice a year just because I watch it. Like, that was... Like, when I was trained into wrestle, like, that was tape study at its finest. And, like, you, you watch some of my matches, like, I'm not even going to try to hide it. We just straight up stole, like, <laughs> three-minute sequences of that match just because it was so perfect, you know, for a lack of a better term. But uh, a, a burning image of that match was Henning's strap ripped off and oh, Bret Hart Brett having him in the sharp... Yep. And Bret Hart oh, having him in the sharpshooter and, oh, my God, it just... With the, uh, with the coach on the outside. Yeah, good. John told us. <laughs> well, why, why do you think they, now that we're just talking about that real quick, why do you think they kept sticking him with mouthpieces? He could talk. He could talk. Yeah, like, I don't know. He's a guy that didn't need it. Like, But some of the guys he was infused with, like early Bret Hart could have stood to have a mouthpiece at that point in time. I love Bret dearly. I, I believe in the patron saint of Bret the Hitman Hart. But, like, you know, in that time period, he wasn't uh he wasn't microphone ready. Right. He was getting there. He was getting there. But uh, so, and at WCW, the fun part with him is when they went to uh, the West Texas Rednecks. Rap like, is crap. Rap is crap. Whoa, <laughs> I hate rap. Um, I feel like that was like really the first thing in WCW other than the Four Horsemen and slamming the door on Flyer's head. Like, I feel like that was... That was the first thing he could sink his teeth into, as campy and corny as it was. Like, what they, they had him with Bobby Duncan Jr., Barry Windham. Barry, Kendall Windham, yeah. Yep. Kendall Windham. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, and, and Barry uh, Windham, yeah. Well, Barry Curly and Henning Hill. were World Tag Team Champions. Yeah. No, it was yeah. good. I mean, it was a good pairing, like, something to sink their teeth into. But much like everything in that era, it just went by the wayside. Well, because it wasn't Hulk Hogan, and it wasn't Kevin Nash, and it wasn't Scott Hall, and it wasn't, you know... And Everybody else they were pushing. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> well look, we're gonna switch topics. Fancy. I I know. We got some money. We're not get, we're not getting paid, but there's money in the budget for the oh, show. The budget. So. Right, we actually have a budget now. I've <laughs> got a green screen. Oh, it's wonderful. I so, thank Danny J Productions every day for the paydays. <laughs> so who, in your opinion, I know we had a discussion about this a few weeks ago where we had given uh, David Arquette a hard time. Who was a world champion that you think never should have been world champion? Oh, my goodness. Uh, whew. I got to go back to what you said. Like, as a kid, I liked Warrior. But I, I don't know. That's a really – that's a tough one. I, who shouldn't have been champion? Well, obviously, David Arquette. Okay, all right, Jeff Jarrett. I'm going to just throw Jeff Jarrett out there. No, why Jeff not? Jarrett, Jeff Jarrett, to me, is a perennial mid-carder. When I think Jeff Jarrett, I think he's a good hand. He's going to give you a solid match with decent storytelling. But when I think of a world title, I think of it as, like, that's the face of your company. And I just don't think Jarrett was ever that guy. WCW tried to make him that guy at the end of the company, but it just it just didn't click. Like you can throw your slap nuts out there, you can beat the whack pack over the head with a guitar all you want, but it's just I don't know. It's mid card to me. It was like the, the whole thing with the guitar is is too. It makes me think of Honky Tonk Man, and I would never put Honky Tonk Man in the main event, no matter how much heat he was drawing. He's just he's not there. But for me, I'm gonna go Jeff Jarrett. I think that's a great choice. I um, I think Jeff Jarrett in his later WCW days was great. I, I do. I think um, well, I enjoyed it. I'm not saying right. that, but uh, well, NWO 2000 aside, 
Um, Jeff Jarrett uh, was, I think, well, he was tight with Vince Russo, which had a lot to do with it. Um, I think yeah. he was solid. He was strong. And, and I think he was world champion material. But I, I see your point because there was a lot of Jeff Jarrett. You got a lot of the same matches with Jeff Jarrett, regardless of who he was in the ring with. Sure. Um, and and wire esque. Yes, and nothing was more a, a pinpoint of that than his time as TNA champion back in the early days of TNA. Every match had a screw yeah. job finish. Every every match he was on the verge of losing, and then it would always find a way to. And it, it, it got old the same, after it was so the long. Same match almost right. move to move, and the same story told. And just going back real quick, I know we we just skipped ahead to TNA, but like. I don't think the way that they started him as world champion did him any favors with that weird bash at the beach 2000 screw job. Yeah. Yep. Did to Hogan. Like, I just, I don't think that helped him at all. I mean, granted, I, I believe didn't Booker beat him later that night. Yeah. Yep. But still already like this guy can't already hold a championship for an hour and a half and, yeah. and you're going to make him the face of your company. Yeah. Uh, point taken. On Booker, but that's another story for another day. Uh, in my opinion, there was a guy, I'm going to go a little old school, and that was Ron Garvin. Um, okay. Ric Flair um, was looking to, I guess, win number five, and they needed to find an opponent that was believable to take the world championship. And he had kind of started this feud with Jimmy Garvin after the yeah. summer of 87, and then Flair beat Jimmy Garvin, won Precious, uh, Jimmy Garvin's valet, for a, a night. And it was Ron Garvin dressed up as Precious that attacked Ric Flair in the hotel room. Oh, I and remember. Set up a big match between Ron Garvin and Ric Flair. Ron Garvin wins the world title in a great match. Don't get me wrong. I, the match was phenomenal, but Flair was involved. And yeah. then he has this one month, maybe month and a half title reign where he loses it in November. He won it in September, lost it in November at Starcade to Flair. So Flair can get number five. And I just remember the entire month and a half that Ron Garvin was champion. He barely came on TV with the title. Um, he barely defended the title. It was a month and a half title reign. And it was like, what was the point of that? And, and even though back then I'm like nine years old, um, I just knew, well, this guy's not going to be champ for long. He, Ric Flair's going to beat him the next time he wrestles. And sure, sure enough, he did. I just, now, do you think he doesn't deserve to be world champion because he's Ronnie Garvin? Or do you think he doesn't deserve to be world champion because of the booking? The booking. And I would say that you had somebody at that time who I would have believed as world champion and Barry Windham. Uh, oh, if I, Barry Windham had won the title, I think that would have been believable. And I'll be talking more about Barry later on in the show. Um, oh, one of the most underrated talents of all time. Absolutely. So uh, you say, um, you say, I'm sorry, you, you <laughs> You J said J J J Jeff Jarrett. J A double yep. R E double T. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett, I <laughs> slot nuts, and then I go, I go, uh, Ron Garvin. All right. So then that, that's going to bring us up to our final point, and that is who was a wrestler that wasn't world champion but should have been. All right, all right. I took the last one first. You go first this time. Well, I, I mentioned his name earlier. I'm going to say Barry Windham. Barry Windham okay. was the international or was the NWA world champion in 1993 when the title got resurrected in 92. But he was never the WCW or World Wrestling Federation champion. And he should have been. Barry Windham had all the tools. He could talk. He had the look. He could wrestle. And he could make any talent look so much better than they were in the ring. He was like Ric Flair in so many ways, but not Ric Flair. It, he was like a, 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 a veteran, a, a tough fighter. Somebody that you went to war with that you could believe this guy's fighting for his victory. He's fighting. He's giving you everything he has. Ric Flair just made everything look so easy. He was a cocky heel. He was so good at it. And you watched him and you're like, okay, that's Ric Flair. But this was Barry Wynn. He was a fighting champion, a fighting man. And just everything he did was so believable. So I wish Barry had a run at the top of WCW. I agree. I, I don't disagree with your choice at all. I think it's a wonderful pick. And, like, not only – he could do everything in the ring, and not to mention just that, he had the size of Hogan. And that's what goes – like, I mean, he wasn't as, as muscular. He's not going to pose at the end of every show. 
but he had the height and the frame and everything. Um, I, I think Barry Windham's a great choice. And for me, uh, I'm going Scott Hall, Razor Ramon. I, I think, well, for me, I, it's Kurt Henning, but we talked enough about him. <laughs> so I'm giving you another choice. And at some point in time, I'm going to kidnap you and bring you over to my house and force feed you Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning matches <laughs> until you get on my side of things, you Jay Brown. Uh, but no, I'm going Razor Ramon, Scott Hall. Um, I understand why he was never the face of the company for all his demons. And for those who don't know, demons equal drugs. Um, so, but like Razor Ramon in WWF, like they had a chance when he was feuding with Bret Hart around Royal Rumble 93. 93, yep. They had that classic match at the Rumble. That's another one I watched every so often. Um, I just, I really think Razor was a guy and they should have pulled the trigger with it. His promo was incredible. He was a merch machine back in the day. You always saw the the Razor Ramon t-shirts. Even when he was bad guy, like they had to force feed us him as a bad guy, but the crowd, like he was one of the first cool heels uh, as, as the business tends to have sometimes. But I don't remember like there being a cool heel like that. Like he's the guy... I always cheered for in matches, unless he was up against Brett. Um, but for me, it's it's got to be Scott Hall. And like I said, I understand why WCW never pulled the trigger. He just wasn't a trustworthy figure at the time. Uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting Scott Hall since he's been clean. I have nothing but good things to say about him. I think he's the nicest guy in the world. If you ever have a chance to go to an autograph signing, pay your 15 bucks for a picture. He'll talk your ear off about wrestling until you're done talking about wrestling. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm glad you broke it down because I always thought I I loved the Razor Ramon character. I just didn't like or I didn't think he would have been champion at that time. If he had stayed, if he had never went to WCW, I think they would have eventually made him world champion. You sure. figure Diesel had a run, Shawn Michaels. They kind of made it known about the click, you know, towards the end of their run. Um, yeah. If he had stuck around through the summer of 96... Shawn Michaels gets the title at WrestleMania 12 in that one-hour match with Bret Hart. And he would have needed an opponent. And Big Van Vader was a great opponent. Don't get me wrong. I'm not taking anything away from Big Van Vader. But you could have easily had Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon one more time. And why? Not? Hey, let's make it a ladder match. You know, I mean, sure. it could have been. It could have been. So, yeah, I, I think if he had stayed, they eventually right would have given. Their, you go back to their history. The story writes itself. Absolutely, and, and maybe maybe you have Razor beat Sean, Sean beats Razor, and then to solve it all, you throw the belt up on the ladder and see what happens. They had the the ladder match rematch at SummerSlam '95, which again, yeah. uh, that match doesn't get the credit I think it deserves. That no, match was exactly just as good. Yeah, same here. Yep, same here. But it's not the original of the two. Now let's fast forward to Scott Hall and WCW. Again, he comes over, brings Kevin Nash with him, you know, in the storyline. But you're not going to make him champion when Hulk Hogan's there. It's it's it was almost like we know the politics, we know it now. Back then we had an idea of it. But you just know that there was there was limitations with these guys and what they could do. And then they signed these guaranteed contracts. So Scott Hall didn't have to really push for anything, he got the guaranteed money anyway. So I think his his match quality started slowing down, and any chance he had of being WCW champion kind of went to the wayside because he kind of just he was a shell of himself. Now we can say it's the demons. It, it may have been the demons at play, but if you have guaranteed money, where's the work ethic? You, you're sure. you're getting paid anyway. What's encouraging you to put that extra in? Once you're already at the top of the mountain, like, where, where do you go from there? What's right. Five, what's pushing you? What's driving you? And you're not going to go back to New York because you, sc you screwed them yeah, over. So. Screwed them over. <laughs> so, oh, well. Well, listen, man, it, just like that, another 30 minutes went quick. And by the wayside, Bob, we're, we're doing it again. Well, I don't know if by the wayside. I mean, your opinion about Mr. Perfect should go by the wayside. <laughs> 
But, uh, you know, I don't think the, the show itself should go by. No, the, the show itself was, was very good. But, no, you're right. Maybe I need to come over. We need to watch some Mr. Perfect matches. And, oh, and maybe you can change my mind. Hey, you're not, you don't have to tell me. I'll, watch, I'll spend the day tomorrow watching them all. And I'll, I'll join you for a couple of brews, and maybe that will help me uh, inspire me as well. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Bob, thank you for joining me for another episode of Point Counterpoint. He is Bob Stedford. I am Mark Lindsay. Please subscribe to the Got Mark 76 YouTube channel and the DJB Productions Network, and we will see you next week here on Point Counterpoint. Goodbye, everybody. The proceeding was brought to you by Got Mark 76 in association with that way cool wrestling show. Please subscribe to Got Mark 76 and DJB Productions Network on YouTube, and until next time, we'll see you at the matches.